I'm going to share my screen. And so what you should see in front of you is 4.1 loops, and it's from Zybooks. So what's a loop? Well, a loop basically is an if statement with code that repeats as many times as you want it to repeat. So looping is our first foray into reusable code. Everything we've done up till now has been the steady flow. So it goes from one, Python executes one line, it executes the next. Last week we figured out how to branch, how to say, if this happens, then do this, otherwise do this other thing. So we learned how to branch. But none of that code was reusable. None of that code could be called multiple times, not with what we've learned so far in this class. So how do we get code that's reusable, and why is it important? Um, I work on a system that is millions of lines of code, millions. Uh, it's a team of people. I don't write all those millions myself. But the important part of reusability is that you write code that can be run again and again and again irregardless of the data values that come in. So it's called data-driven code, and what you do is you provide ways to reduce the amount of code that you have to write and reduce the amount of code that you have to maintain. That's the overall purpose of when I say reusability. That's what I'm talking about. In this class, you won't get into maintaining the code and the cost of writing code. When you move out of this class, and you either go into other classes to be a programmer or you go to some other form of technology, it's important to understand reusability. And so I start at this point in the class kind of harping on reusability, and it's going to go through the rest of the class. So. Um, but this is our first foray into the ability to use the same lines of code multiple times and then just figure out what the data is. So that's what loops, that's what the concept of looping is. Um, and it builds on the concept of branching because a loop statement is just an if statement that can repeat itself. That's all it is. So if you already understood an if statement, and you don't even have to understand else at this point, if you already understood an if statement, a loop is another form of branch that repeats itself. That's all it is. And then we have the syntax, and we have some extra stuff to figure out if we should stop or if we shouldn't stop. But the basic premise of a loop is an if statement that repeats itself. So whenever we're talking about a loop, you know, you got the concept of if last week, now we're expanding on that concept. So there are, um, a loop repeats itself, and the repeat is called an iteration. So if you talk, hear somebody talk about an iteration, it is one time, a single iteration is one time through the loop. Multiple iterations are multiple times through the loop. That's all they talk about when they're talking about an iteration. It's just one time through the loop. Um, not going to worry about that. Not going to worry about that. Okay, so let's get into the mechanics of a loop. There are two different kinds of loops that are used in Python. There is a while loop and a for loop. I will tell you right now that the while loop is the loop you're going to use for your game control. So when you're thinking about your game, you're thinking about how you're going to set up your main control loop, your main control loop will be a while loop. Okay? So just 
put that in the back of your head for when you start looking at what you're going to do for the game and what you're going to do for some of the pro, um, for some of the assignments. So while basically is a keyword in Python that sets Python up to understand that something repeatable is about to happen. Okay, that's what while does. It says, here we go, Python get ready, we're going to have repeatable code in my block. And it also says, right after the word while, there's going to be an expression that says whether or not you should enter that code and do at least a single iteration. So those are the two things that while does for Python. So what in the world is the expression? Okay, the expression is basically an if statement. You just don't use the word keyword if because you've already used the keyword while. But it takes the same form. It's going to have an equivalent operator. You can use less than, greater than, any of the Boolean operators that we talked about last week can be used in this expression. In fact, you can take an if, substitute it with a while, substitute the two keywords, and run that as a loop. Now, will it run as a loop? Maybe not. But that's when you're thinking about this expression right here, this is where I am right now, while you're thinking about that expression, think about first as, you, if, as if you were writing an if statement and then substitute the word while for it. And that's, that, that I'm hoping that kind of gets you into the mindset of understanding that this is just another form of a branch. It's just repeatable. So then you're going to have what's inside the loop. So just like with if statements, you have to indent things one after the if. Well, you have to indent things one after the while. That says I'm inside the body of the loop. And that's the way we talk about it. You, you are either inside the body of the loop or you're not inside the body of the loop. So anything that is indented one, at least one, is inside the body of the loop, and anything that is not, is not inside the body of the loop and will not be executed in an iterative fashion. So um, let's go, let me do this, ignore my thing here, I'll start a new project. That's my me talking to Watson, IBM Watson, using Python. Uh, where is it? Pure Python. All right. So I should have this done. Week four. Okay. I know. Okay. So let me create a new file. Simple while. Add a configuration. I apologize, I didn't have this done ahead of time. Python. Simple while. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to create a while loop, and first, and I'll, I'll show you this because this is often how it is used, and when you start thinking about your game, this is how you're going to want to use it. So I'm going to say, um, I can type. No, 
No, that's not what I want to do. I'm going to have go equal true. I'm going to say while. Sorry, I was typing Java there with the parentheses. While go is not false. So some of this you'll see, answer is just an input statement. And we'll talk about break in a second. So I've just written a really quick program here, and I've, I've defined this thing called go, and I've set it to true. And then I said if go is not false, then I'm going to ask somebody to enter a number or quit. If they enter Q, I'm going to break, and we'll talk about break in a little bit. If I, they don't enter Q, then I'm going to print the answer is and go up to the top of the loop again. So let's see how this works. So I'm just going to debug my, my friendly little program. You'll see that I am on go equal true. Now go is what they call a utility variable. Its only job right now is to set us up to get inside that loop for the first time. Okay? So that's all I want to do. I want to get into that loop for the first time. Now there are a couple of different ways I could do this. I've chosen this way. So when I step over this line, you'll see I'm going to line 5. Now we can see here in PyCharm in debug mode that it says Go is true. That means that Go is not false because it's true, which means I will get to line 6. So if I step over that, I'm now on line 6. And I'm going to say enter, enter a number or cue to quit. So I'm going to step over that. The program's now going to pause. I'm going to enter 42. Hit the enter key. If the answer is Q, I'm going to break. And break just says stop the loop. We'll see that in a little bit in Zybooks. It's going to print, the answer is 42. Now you'll see it automatically went back to line 5. That's what a loop does. Okay, A loop just goes back to the top. Line 5 is the top of the loop. And now we're going to flow down in to the, the block again. So I'm still true. Go hasn't changed. So I'm going to ask them to add another, um, enter another answer. I'm now back on line 7. I'm going to print what it is. I'm back up at the top. It's going to ask me for another answer. I'm going to do that. I'm now at 7 again. This is the third time I've been at line 7. But I've only written line 7 once. This is reusability. The answer is not Q. I'm going to print it. Now I'm going to stop. So I'm going to, it's going to say, okay, give me the answer. This time I'm going to print, enter Q. Q will be true here. This is just a normal if statement like we learned last week. I'm going to go into this break statement and I'm going to stop the program because I exited the loop and there was nothing to do outside the loop. So that is the mechanism of a loop. That is how a loop works. It, is, it allows you to repeat again and again and again your code. 
this is the basis for your game. You're going to have to have your game play in a big while loop. So uh, with a sentinel value. So here it says, well, user value is not Q. Um, and that is essentially what I did with this, except for one thing. Instead of this, I'm going to say um, just something. I'm going to say, wow, quit. It's not equal to Q. And then I don't have to have this. So this is what a sentinel value is. You'll notice I just got rid of two lines of code because I decided to change. Remember I said there were several different ways you could handle getting out of the loop? Well, this is one of them. So if I run this again, you'll see that, uh, sorry, there we go. Did I run it or debug it? I did enter a number or quit. I'm going to enter 42. Oh, I'm running it. My bad. I wanted to debug it. Okay, so we debug it. I step over it. Now I'm here with while quit is not equal to Q. Right now I have set quit to a dash. Could have been a letter Z. Could have been an empty space. It doesn't matter as long as it's the same type. And it's not the the value that will force the loop to break, the loop to to evaluate to false. The only way I get into this loop, the only way I pass line five and get into this loop to do whatever I need to is for this to evaluate to true. Okay? That has to be true. So if quit is not equal Q, if it's anything else, then it will evaluate to true. So I'm going, I, it's, so it's dash. So now I'm going to enter a number or enter Q to quit. I'm going to enter 42. It's going to print the answer. Whoops. It's going to print the answer. It's going to come back. I'm going to hit Q this time. I think I'm ahead of myself. Yeah. Whoops. Q this time. And this time it's going to print that the answer is Q. And it's going, oh, what did I not do? Answer is Q. What did I do wrong? Oh, this is something to not do. I need to be checking the correct variable. So what I did wrong was I had answer here. And answer and quit are not the same. So that's uh, my teacher bad. Uh, so now it will, in fact, quit if I tell it to quit. So let's try this one more time. I'm at Q. I've got my sentinel value. It's a string. It's not Q. Now I have quit equal input. So quit's going to be, in this case, 42. We see that quit has now changed to 42. This is what you do. So I have my sentinel value here. I'm checking the sentinel value in the while loop. I'm then resetting the sentinel value in the while loop to whatever the user input is. And then... I've input 42. It's going to print out that the answer is 42. Quit is not yet Q. It's 42. And 42 is not equal to Q. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to answer it. I'm going to put in Q this time. So now quit is Q. It's going to tell me that the answer is Q. I'm now back, at, back up at the top of the list. And the program's going to end because there's nothing else to do, and this evaluated to false, because quit 
was finally Q. So Q is not equal to Q is false. Um, so we just talked about iterations and what a block is. Um, we just did a basic while loop with user input. And here's some more while examples. Um, let's see what's interesting. So that's just a random integer getting input until the sentinel is seen. We just kind of did that. Um, let's see. Counting. Okay. So you can count with a while loop, but I will tell you that if you're really going to be counting, you want to use the next kind of loop, which is a for loop. But it's important to understand how to count with a while loop. Because what we learned in, in, this, in the simple while is that you can set up a loop that will repeat itself based on user input, which is exactly what you have to do for your game. But there are often times where you're going to count. You're going to have a list or you're going to have a dictionary and get the keys from the dictionary and then roll through that set of keys. So you want to learn how to count because oftentimes you will write a loop that is going to go to length minus one of a list. So let's do a quick while loop with counting. Okay. I found files. So we'll do a quick while loop with counting. Okay. Hello. So I am just going to make this really simple. I'm just going to say uh, num is 10 while counter less than num. That's all I'm going to do. Well, hold on. Yeah, there we go. So, and that, again, six lines of five lines of code to to do a while with a counter. So I'm just going to run this one, and we will see that it started at 0 and ended at 9. And that's what I asked it to do. I said counter is less than num while counter is less than num. So here's counter. It starts at 0. Here's num. It's at 10. And then I'm going to print counter is, and then I've got to remember to increment it. Because if I don't do this, I'll show you what it's going to do. It's going to make me unhappy. It's just going to keep going. See that? that that's just running and running and running. Because I didn't tell it to stop. I didn't do anything inside the loop to tell it to stop. So I always have to make sure I tell it to stop. And the way I tell it to stop is by incrementing the left-hand side of the expression. Counter is on the left-hand side of the Boolean expression. Num is on the right hand side. Now I could have written this the other way. I could have said while num is greater than counter. But you have to increment the thing that you're counting. If you forget to increment it, you will have a, an infinite loop and Zybooks will stop that loop and it will give you a timeout exception. Now, I can't do that on PyCharm. PyCharm will simply run forever because it assumes that I told it to do what I wanted it to do. But if you get a timeout exception in Zybooks, it's because your loop is not exiting. So you need to go back and take a look at your loop. But this is a simple while with a counter.
That's all it needs to be. So when you're looking at this, that's all they're doing, while i less than or equal to n. And here they're doing, oh, yep, did somebody ask a question? Can you explain this with counting syntax, like the input from user, the 4.17 lab is what I'm referring to. Okay, we will get to 4.17, and then we'll go through that. Is that okay? Okay. So we will make sure we have enough time. Okie dokie. Okay, that's cool. For loops. I just talked about counting with while loops. I don't use counting for while loops. I have for loops. For loops are built for counting. You can do all kinds of neat things with for loops. You can say if something is in a list, you can just count things up. It's very handy. I use for loops all the time. It is important if you're going to program in Python, Java, a lot of languages that have a for loop to get really familiar because I use for loops much more than I use while loops. Partly because I work with data code, data driven code. A lot of times the data is coming from a database. I'm not dealing with direct user input. Um, but this is what I use most of the time. So the for loop syntax is very much like the syntax for a while loop. The only thing that's different is you're using a keyword for. For tells Python, I'm about to start a loop. This loop will be specifically for counting. Okay, that's what for loops are for. You can't like deal with user input but in for loops like you can with while loops. But there's also other neat things you can do, and this right here is one of them. It says, for name in Bill, Nicole, John, print hi. So what this is, is this is a list, and we'll, we'll get really deep into lists next week. But this is a list. I don't even have to count the list. All I have to do is roll through this list and print the element in the list. That's all I have to do. And it's very simple, and the syntax is very easy. It's not, um, it's not cumbersome. So, and this is another for loop. In this case, it's over a dictionary. You can print the key value pairs for, um, for um, a dictionary. Okay. So for loop printing a dictionary, this is very handy to do. Um, but I've, I've had students get stuck on 4.25. 4.25 is this right here. When it's talking about doing a for loop to print a dictionary, this is uh, the example that you want to use. Oh, wait a minute. No, 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 no. My bad. This is the example. 4.51, figure 4.51 will help with challenge 4.52. I'm trying to keep my eye on the time. Okay. Range. Range is very important. We're taught, well, let me, let me do what I did with while loop. Okay. New. Simple four. All right. So I'm just going to have counter. Sorry. I'm just going to say num. Enter a number. And I'm making it an integer. And then I'm going to say four. Uh, 
Okay, so this is just three lines of code. I've got a, some user input here. I'm just going to have it input a number. I'm going to make sure it's an integer because for loops deal with either sets, which would be a list or dictionary, or they deal with numbers. And for x, x is just a variable name. I could have called it counter. I could have called it Fred. It's just a variable name. Then I have this other keyword called in. In basically tells Python that what's coming next is a sequence, a list, some form of a list, um, and that the, the variable immediately preceding the word in needs to be part of that, um, that, that sequence. And that's what a range does. Range gives me a sequence. I don't have to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I can use a range. So if I just print, if I just run this, that's, whoops, wrong one. Nope, not doing good there. Okay. So if I run this, I'm going to enter the number 5, and you see 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, I could have also done this a different way. So let me comment this out. I could have done this a couple of ways. So I'm just going to show you because range could also be, uh, hold on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay? So for x in that. So it won't deal. I took out the num. But I wanted you to see that it could do this just over a list. The answer to the number doesn't matter. And then it's going to go 9. So the range is equivalent to creating a list. Now, this isn't exactly what happens under the hood because I have given the user control and I have num here, but I just wanted to let you see that those two things work pretty much the same. And when we get into lists, if I just created a list and said, um, just like that, I could create a for list, a for loop, Oops. I could simply use this for and in to go through every element in my list. So I just have this beautiful little list here. And if I run this, I'm going to enter the number 2. And then later it's going to say item is hello 42 and 10 because it went through this for loop the second time. Now, this is going to become important, this, and this is going to become important when you do your project. You're going to have you're going to have rooms. You're going to have items that are going to be in a list. You're going to have a dictionary, and that dictionary is going to have rooms and its relationship to other rooms. So this is something important to get comfortable with. Okay, as well, your main loop, the main gameplay loop, is going to be a while loop. You're going to have other things that happen in for loops. So range, I just showed you, and what range does is it under the hood, it creates a list. That's what it does. You can think of range as a, a convenience function, because range is a function, and it creates a list. So if I said range 5, it would create a list at 0, 1, 2, and 3, 4, because as we found out when we first introduced lists, 
that everything starts at zero. So it's always minus one. So if I have a range of five, which means I'm going to have five entries in the list, it's going to start at zero and end at four. Range zero to five, exact same thing. The nice thing about range is you can do something like range three to seven, and it's going to start at the number three and end at the number six. So range basically is a function that creates a sequence or a list, and then the for loop is going to take that list and it's going to run with it. Now there are also ways to do things like incrementing the list differently. So for instance, you can put, you do from 0 to 5 and increment 2. So instead of saying, I'm just going to move one element in the list, you're going to move two elements in the list. Or in this case, it's going to go 0, 2, and 4 which will be interesting if you're doing like something that's odd and even. So this is very helpful if you're doing odd and even. Um, so this is how you go backwards. You're going to start at 5, end at 0, and you're going to increment by minus 1. So this tells range to build a list that starts at 5 and ends at 1 and it tells it that you're going to go backwards. So you're, 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 it creates the list from the largest number to the smallest number. And this is very similar except you're going every other. It's not a complete, it's, the sequence isn't um, being decremented by 1, it's being decremented by 2. Um, while versus four. While is really good for user input. Four is for counting. Nested loops. You can put a loop in another loop. You can put as many loops in a loop as you want. You can put if statements in a loop. You can put while state while loops inside for loops or for loops inside while loops. Um, you can do any of that. There are no restrictions associated with how you nest your loops. Now, there are a couple of things that you're going to want to think about when you are nesting loops. Um, and that is when, when they talk about rows and columns, because what a nested loop is really good for is a matrix. So if you've ever seen a spreadsheet, like an Excel spreadsheet, you'll know that they have rows and columns. And that, um, and, and so you use nested loops. And it's what they call row-wise. So that you have, you go through the rows and then the cells. Let me give you guys a quick example. Okay. We'll take a look at that, Daniel. Let me do a quick example of nested loops. Okay. Actually, let's do this. Let us... Developing programs incrementally. Baby steps. Best way I can put it. Don't try and write an entire program from start to finish. It, it will always be buggy. Write a little bit of code, test it. Write a little bit of code, test it. That's really what they're talking about when they talk about incremental programs. And I'm kind of get, flipping through this because I know there are two, lab, two different questions on two different labs and I want to be able to go through them. Break statement. Break basically says, given a certain condition, stop the loop that I'm in. That's what it says. It says, don't pass go, don't collect $200, stop the loop. You, if you have nested loops, as we see here in figure 4.10.1, you have to know what you're breaking out of. This break statement will only break out of this for loop, while this break statement will break out of this for loop. So if you have nested loops, you won't be stopping. If you will only be stopping the, the, out, the outermost loop, uh, when you hit 
the break statement associated with the outermost loop. So um, that's just something to remember when you're dealing with nested loop. If you're not dealing with nested loops, a break statement is going to break out of the only loop there. There's also something called continue because sometimes you're not going to want to do everything in a loop. And it gets very cumbersome to have these really big blocks of if-else statements. So what you can do is you can use a continue statement. If you hit a certain condition and you know you don't want to execute any more code in that loop, you say, okay, continue, and it's going to take you back up to the top of the loop, and you're going to start just like you would have if you, if you hadn't used the continue and had flowed down the whole way. So that's what continue does. It allows you to skip lines of code that you don't want to ex execute in, um, in a loop, but it does it based on the condition. So a continue or a break are always going to be under an if statement. That's pretty much the only way they work. Okay, loop else. I never use a loop else. Um, because once I'm out of the loop, it'll do that anyway. You can go ahead and practice loop else. Um, it is valid syntax in Python. It's just not something I use a lot. Um, getting both index and value when looping. The enumerate function is, um, is, very handy if you want to use it. Um, I I tend to not use it, but um, that's just because I'm a little old school. So enumerate, you'll see here, what they're trying to say is you'll see here that you're going to like do format index value, format index value you can use to make it a much more shorthand way of doing it. So instead of doing this line right here, instead you can do it all based on a single four. So basically the enumerate origins says origins is your list. I want both the index and the value. So index will get placed in the index variable. Value will get placed in the value variable and then you can just use them. So it's a, it's a function that's very handy and allows you to use some form of shorthand. I'm not going to go over the dice statistics. Let's see. So is this the one? Sorry. Daniel, is this the one that you wanted on the second challenge? So this is the first challenge. Or is it the challenge, Daniel, or the lab? Let me know. And while we do that, password modifier. Okay, so drawing the triangle. Drawing the triangle can be a little bit daunting for new students. Um, so basically what they want is they want you, a user is going to enter a character and a height. So you're going to print a character, and it's going to start with one, and then it's going to go 234, 2345, 23456. So how in the world do you do that? It was the lab. That's fine. We'll go back to the lab in just a minute, Daniel. So I'll do this one, and then we'll do that one. So this is really um, a nested loop. So when you do this, what you want to do is you're going to, um, yeah, hold on, sorry, I'm drawing a brain. Um, so we really didn't do nested loop, that's okay. File. Lab 4.7. So basically what we want to do is we want to have the user input 
a character and a number, and then output a triangle from that. That's just my thing. So the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to Im input a character. So I'm just going to make mine that, and then a number. And then what do we get, what are we going to do with this? So let's sit down and think about this for a second. What are we going to do with this so that we can print out a triangle? Well, let's just do a little experimenting first. So if I say for counter in range 0, comma, num. Whoops, that's got to be a zero, not a no, comma, num, print, uh, stir. So let's just see what happens. Does anybody think this is going to work and magically get me the triangle? No. But this is a place to start, and we're doing baby steps. So I know that I get four rows. I get one, two, three, and four. Okay, that's fine. So now, how do I get it to print? I got it. I got the first line to work. But on the next line, I have to print two. And then the next line, I have to print three. And the next line, I have to print four. So this means I'm going to have to have another loop. Well, let's think about this. Let's see what happens. Okay, well, I got an extra line. I didn't really need that. So what I did didn't work. So we know that that's not an easy solution. So what we have to do here is we're going to have to print long and wide. So each time I go through the iteration, I want to determine how many times I print. So let me just try another thing here, too, because this is something that we haven't used a lot in Python. But it's going to be very handy in this function. You will see that I said end is just that. Or do we have to have space? Maybe we have to have space. OK. So now I know that I can have a print statement with a bunch of them on a line, in this case 4, which is this number, by just having this print stir end is a space. So that helps because now, let's see if I do this. If I do 4 in, uh, let's see, 0, comma, counter, what happens? OK. Well, it didn't quite do what I want, but that's OK. Because maybe let's see what happens. So I'm getting closer, aren't I? Did you see what just happened? So I'm going to leave this here, and I'm going to let you guys figure out the rest. Because this is not 100% done. It's not. This is not the full solution. You guys still have to do your input stuff, and you have to figure out how to get that that last row with all four in it. Okay, so but this should get you started, and this will go up with um, this will go up with, on the YouTube channel. But this is the beginning. I'm not going to do any more. I know that this is a hard one because you're being forced to use multiple loops, but this is the start. Okay. Okay. So does that kind of answer what you needed to have answered, Valerie?
I'm going to assume yes. And we're going to go... So, Daniel, you need the password modifier one. Is that correct? Oh, but didn't I just do 4.17? Oh, I just did 4.16. No, drawing a right triangle. Okay, I'm sorry, Valerie. Ah, the mad lab loops. Okay. And then I promise to get to yours, Daniel. I promise we'll go back and get to yours. Um, you provide various words and use to complete a short story. Oh, I'm glad you like 4.16. Um, oh, I need to rename that, don't I? Before I forget, let's rename this. Rename 4.16 so I don't get it wrong. Okay. So basically, um, you're going to have apples, let's see, write a program that takes a string and an integer as input and outputs a sentence using the input values as shown in the examples below. The program repeats until the input string is quit. This is interesting because this is also very, very close to what we did in our simple while loop, okay? So here, it's going to take two strings. It's, sorry, it's going to take, is it two strings? A string and an integer, and it's going to output the sentence using the input values shown in the example. And then it's going to repeat until you enter quit. So what we're going to do is we're going to modify this. So we're going to start with quit is equal to something that is not the word quit. So this is just while quit is not quit. Then I'm going to have two inputs. So in this case, I'm just going to leave that one there. And I'm going to say num input. and put a number, so we'll just, and then we're going to have to make this an integer, so I'm going to let you do that. Oops. And then I'm just going to print out what I did, okay? So I'm going to just, I'm just going to actually let you guys do that, because this will just be the print statement. Now, I want to, sorry, enter a string or quit. Now, you're going to probably not want to actually have anything inside the parentheses. However, this is very close to the answer that you need. So our simple while is actually very close to what you need to do for this um, problem. Because this is exactly what they're talking about when they're talking about using a sentinel value. That's what 4.17 does. It uses that sentinel value and a while loop. Does that make sense, Valerie? Oh, I'm glad. So now let's go back for Daniel to 4.15, the password modifier. This one can seem a little tricky, but it really isn't. Um, it says, many user-created passwords are simple and easy to guess. Write a program that takes a simple password and makes it stronger by replacing characters using the keys below. So basically, you're just going to go through and replace things. Um, so basically what you're going to do is you're just going to go through a string is a list that's all it is so you want to go through the string of whatever we typed in and change it so A becomes at M becomes so it's, it's a loop 
with some if statements. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I'll get you started. Now, we haven't learned regular expressions yet, so I'm not going to do regular expressions. But it would be much easier if we were doing them. So I'm just going to copy this in so that I can just reference it. Okay. So I'm going to have some user input. Okay, that's all I'm doing, just some user input. Now, password is a series of characters. That's all it is. It's just a list. It's an immutable list. But what I want to do is I want to be able to get each element in the list. Well, we know that we can treat a string like a list. We can't change it, but we can treat it like a list. So if I want to do that, I would use a for loop like this. And right now I'm just going to print So right now I'm just going to run it like this. Okay, 4.15. And if I run 4.15, it's going to enter a password, please, and I'm going to say A, B, C, D, E. And it's going to say characters A, B, C, D, E. So now we know that we can get each individual character. So if I can get an individual character, and let's say I want to replace A with that, I can say if care is the same as a, then uh, we're going to use a helper variable for this one. We're going to say, just create an empty list. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, because I'm creating, now I'm creating a new password. But I have to do it in a way where I can add things up. So I can, well, I can just do string concatenation. So it doesn't need to be like that. So what I can do is if care is an A, I can say password equal and plus the substitute. And then I can say otherwise, so let's just look and see what happens with this, okay? Now I haven't looked at the right answer in a while, so I don't know that this is exactly the way they do it. But logically, this is how you would build a program with baby steps. So I'm going to do A, B, C, D, E. And what I get is uh, the character A is why did it do that? Okay. Oh, no, that's right. Password is, all right. Oh, I know what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. Sorry, I'm having brain. It's after 10 o'clock and my brain just shuts off. So I'm going to try something. 
let's see. Uh, I think it's just going to be easier to deal with it like a list. Let's see what happens here. Whoops, what did I do? Unexpected end of file format stir because I this is this is when you get an unexpe unexpected end of file. Oftentimes you're missing a closing parenthesis, which is what I'm missing now. So let's do this. Okay, I'm still not doing it right. Dot append. Oh, that was my problem all along. I defined it in the wrong place. So does anybody know what was happening there as my brain shuts down? When password was here, every time I got to the top of the list, it rewrote password. It just did. So password always started as brand new when it got to these if statements. So it shouldn't have done that. So I'm just going to go back and do this. I'm going to get rid of this guy. I'm going to say, because I am i don't want to, you guys to have to do a lot of list stuff. Um, okay, better. Sorry. Sorry my brain froze up. Okay. So now let's see what happens. All of this is pretty much the same except I moved the variable out here. I moved my helper variable, new password, outside the loop because every when I defined it inside the loop, it was getting replaced every time. So BCDE, and I come up with at BCDE. So that is the start of Lab 4.15. Okay? And you're going to have to do the substitution for all of these and make sure that when you print it out, you print it out appropriately. Okay? So, um, but that's generally how you will go through 4.15. Does that answer your question, Daniel? Okay. I'm assuming that does. Uh, not a problem. And um, I am going to call the class for tonight unless anybody has any questions. Um, and this will probably be up on the YouTube site tomorrow. I will send, uh, I'll post an announcement in my class and I'll send the announcement out to any of the other teachers and just also go out and look on it. It should come up as the latest video. I'm good. New password update every time we replace a character. Yes. What happens here is New password, I've told it it's a string. And then because strings are immutable, what Python does under the hood is when I say new password equals new password plus whatever that is, Python under the hood creates a brand new string and passes it back. And this assignment puts that new set of characters, that new sequence of characters, into new password. And because I moved new password outside the loop, which is what I should have done in the first place, it works correctly. When new password was inside the loop, it works incorrectly. 
So if I do this, I get the error that I was having before. And all we see here is that new password is a single character. And that's because every time it hit this line, new password was being rewritten as an empty string. By taking this out of here and putting it here, I now remove that. It only ever creates a brand new string once. So whenever it's being used inside the loop, it gets populated correctly. So we see here that new password is at BCDE. So that is how you deal with this particular problem. And you always make sure that your helper variable is outside the loop. So um, does that answer your question, Daniel? Okay. I'm going to call it. I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to stop the screen sharing. Um, yes, you can absolutely, in fact, here, um, well, no, actually, you do not want to use LF because the letters are not mutually exclusive. Wait a minute. No, care. Yes, I'm sorry. Stop. My, it's after 10. This is what happens to my brain after 10. Yes, please. Use LF. Absolutely use LF because the characters are mutually exclusive. You are completely right. It's time for me to stop because I don't think it went right after 10 o'clock. Okay. You guys have a good evening. This should be up tomorrow. Um, and I hope you guys have a good weekend too. It's supposed to not be, be miserable hot this weekend. So, and I will talk to you later.